But the primary responsibility for raising the next generation for the glory of God and the belief of Je in Jesus Christ is laid upon dads and moms. Your, what's your mandate from God? Train them in the Word of God. Uh, use it, exercising our authority if we ourselves have not submitted ourselves to God's authority and the commandments of His Word. I just recently had uh, one of my, my favorite copy of the King James Version. I just had it recovered. And um, so this week I opened it up and I was just flipping through page by page in the book of Proverbs. And I was looking at my notes and things that I'd underlined and so forth. And I've had this Bible since college. And uh, it was just really interesting to see for me to to see the verses that I had underlined. And, and, I, and I felt like I could see uh, the evidence of a young father and husband <laughs> desperately searching the book of Proverbs for wisdom and help because every verse about child rearing or husband and wife relationship was underlined. So, um, so this, is that, this probably grew out of all that, I would imagine. So, but avoiding the pitfalls of child rearing. Uh, the first thing that I, I want to bring up is, uh, well, let's read our text first. Verse 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So that's Proverbs 22, 6. We'll just put that over here. And that really is, I mean, it, it is a key passage um, for the whole Old Testament and New Testament, quite honestly, when it comes to Christian parenting. It really is the seminal text, you might say. But you, you have to interpret it right, and you have to let the, the light of so much other Scripture shine on it. But it really is the, the key text. But the first thing we want to talk about tonight is uh, when we talk about avoiding pitfalls of child rearing, is uh, a word that nobody wants to talk about. Discipline. Yeah, discipline with tempered love. Discipline with tempered love. And these, of course, we need to give, and we're going to with some scripture passages in Proverbs, we need to think about each one of these a little bit. We can't park on them tonight, but I think I can help us, you know, apply them scripturally. And maybe you see too why I have added this, because a lot of times we could say discipline with love, but we need to define what that means. Um, been many, many person do things wrong while they're saying they're loving. Amen? So we need to understand what the Bible says when we say discipline with love. Um, it can, that can go either way. It can also go into permissiveness uh, as we discipline with love. So we need to be careful. So let's look at a few of these passages uh, and kind of try to uh, do some interpreting. Proverbs 23, 12 through 18. So I'm just going to start writing some of these up here. All right. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, or the King James says, hell. Uh, another translation might be death. So you're going to have to, as an interpreter, we're going to have to de decide which translation of the, the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol can be hell, like the place of punishment. It can be the grave, or it can literally mean death. So we would need to interpret that. Uh, verse 15, 
Um, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart, uh, my, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Proverbs nineteen eighteen through 20. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. A man of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. So let me stop there. I've got a few more, but I want to stop there and explain a few things before we kind of bury, <laughs> get buried here. Um, I know that we're going to jump out immediately in our culture and see the words strike. And uh, we do need to understand some things here. Um, what the Bible is saying and what the Bible is not saying. All right, and we'll... We'll, add, uh, we'll look at that in light of Scripture. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words. This is Proverbs 23, 12. And your ear to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not, will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol or from hell or from the grave. All right, so first of all, what the Bible um, is not saying, it's not saying abuse, okay? When it says striking with the rod, you see, we immediately think in English the word rod, but uh, in the sense of um, a stick, you know, to hurt someone, okay? But remember, we're thinking biblically here. And in the Bible, uh, we see the word rod. What, what other, can you think of another passage of Scripture where the word rod is used? A very famous passage. Yeah, Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Comfort me. Not abuse me. Comfort me. So when we see rod, we need to... We need to understand that there is a literal and a metaphorical application. The literal is you might use a rod to spank, possibly to maybe swat a hand or something like that. Uh, not a stick, you know, to whack somebody. But literally, it may mean what we would call tempered, loving, parental, corporal punishment. Okay. And I don't even like the word punishment. I would say more correction. Um, so there are times, possibly, when a tempered, loving, uh, Spanking might, might be in order. The other, though, we need to understand that in the light of, say, like, like we said a moment ago, of Psalm 23. I'm going to just put it right here. Psalm 23. God's rod is a rod of comfort. It's a rod that, that uh, guides us, protects us. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I fear no evil. So it's not an evil rod. It's not an abusive rod. It's a shepherd's rod, isn't it? And what does a shepherd do with the rod? The staff. He defends the sheep against wolves, lion, bear, all these different things. He uses it to guide the sheep. If one's kind of getting out of the way, he might take it and get that sheep back over. If one falls off uh, or falls down in a, a ravine, I'm told that a shepherd might use the crook of it to help pull that sheep back out of a hole because sheep fall on their back, they can't get up. And a, a sheep can literally die laying on its back because it can't get up. 
So the shepherd can use the staff to pull the sheep out of a little ravine or these kinds of things. And if absolutely necessary, then a shepherd can use it to inflict a little bit of pain. Okay? So that's the, we would say, the metaphor or the literal understanding of what the Bible is saying about this, this kind of discipline your child, you can strike and so forth. All right? Before I move on to that, though, I want to talk about the metaphorical use. When it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When it says here to use the rod, what are we really talking about? Does God use a real shepherd's rod in our life? You ever seen a crook come down out of heaven and whack you on it or, you know, <laughs> that ever happened? No. So what are we really talking about when we say thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me? Well, God is using a term that people in that time and in that place were familiar with, and that is shepherding. The people of Jacob were shepherds. Remember Pharaoh and the Egyptians thought they were nasty because they were herdsmen. You know, they didn't want to be, have anything to do with them. They thought they were dirty. And so the, the Israelites were very comfortable with shepherding and taking care of sheep. So when Psalm 23, David, written by David, a shepherd, writes this, what does he mean by that? Let me give you another example. Instead of a rod, like a shepherd's rod, think of a sword. Now, in the book of Romans, the Bible says that the government, the civil government, does not bear the sword in vain. So what is the sword? It's a symbol of, here we go, authority. The word of God, correction, authority. This is what we're saying. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In other words, the authority of your word, the correction of, of your, your authority, your sovereignty as the true and the living God, as the great shepherd, they guide me. Okay? And, of course, we would say um, with the uh, government, they, bear the, they do not bear the sword in vain. They, they, don't, they do not bear... God-given authority. They have, sword is a weapon, so when he says that the government doesn't have the sword in vain, what it means is God has given civil government the authority to enforce laws which might entail punishment or even the taking of life, a sword. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about a shepherd's staff, a rod. So now you say, so it does teach spanking, or, you know, using a rod at times? Yes. But what, what does this word mean? I believe in discipline in our children. Okay. What do you mean by that? Training. Training. Yeah. This discipline, we also get another word from discipline, and that is the word disciple. A, a disciple, we might think of a disciple of Jesus. We're all disciples of Jesus. The disciples in the Gospels, what, what made them a disciple? They followed Jesus. They adhered, they believed in him, they adhered to his teaching and followed his authority. Remember what he said? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I say? You see, so part of being a disciple is a learner, being instructed, guided, which sometimes might be, have its uh, intense moments, but, it might, but most of the time it's more guiding, nurturing, which is why Paul says in Ephesians that we are to bring our children up or rear them in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. So we got discipline, which is instruction, the proper use of authority. So the mom, I mean the dad and the mom, the, the authority flows from God to dad to mom. And this use of authority is delegated, it's limited. 
okay? Just like God told uh, Christian masters, if you don't take care of your slaves and you, are not, and you are mean to them, remember, you have a master in heaven. Well, every parent needs to realize this. If we don't take care of our children properly and rear them properly, we have a heavenly father in heaven whom we'll have to answer to. We got discipline, which is a whole lot less spanking and a lot more teaching. And tempered, why is it tempered? Because our authority is limited, it's delegated. And we have no business uh, using, exercising our authority if we ourselves have not submitted ourselves to God's authority and the commandments of his word. We can't be out of control. We have to be, we can't, dis we can't teach somebody discipline if we're not disciplined. Amen? And then love. Real love does this. Now let's read the rest of these passages in this first section, and I think you'll, it, it comes, kind of bears it out. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. Whoever spares his rod hates his son. So in other words, if you love your son or your daughter, you're just going to spank them all the time. Is that what it's saying? No. No. Remember what the rod is? Whoever spares the rod. If you don't care about teaching, if you and I don't care about uh, discipling our children, teaching them limitations, guiding them in right and wrong, building discernment, teaching them how to, the knowledge of God and the truth of the gospel and, and those things, if we don't do that, we don't love our children. The Bible says we hate them. You say, well, why would the Bible say, you? well, if I have denied my children the knowledge of God, God's truth, God's forgiveness, God's family, I have taken from them the most valuable things they could ever have. There's no way in the world I love them properly. These people that say, you know, well, I don't want to take my kids to church. I want them to grow up and learn on their own. That's not love. That's not respect. That's like saying, well, my child is, is sick and it may be to death, but we're going to just stay home and wait and see when they grow up if they want to go to the doctor, if they make it. That's terrible, isn't it? That's not love. So we see that Proverbs gives us so much insight here. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And why? Because we're born sinners. You ever notice this? I've said it before. We, we don't have to teach children to lie, do we? We don't have to teach them to disobey. In fact, all you got to do is say, now, sweetie, you can play with all these right here, but don't touch that. <laughs> this is the only thing now that they want. Why? Because we're the same way. That's the sin nature. God says, don't go any farther than this. And the only thing we can think about is across that line. God said, now you can eat of every tree of the, free, of the, of the field of, and, and all that. Just don't eat this one. Now, of course, they didn't have a sin nature then, but they were tempted to do the wrong thing by the tempter. And then that began this fall and then, of course, the entrance of sin and temptation. I didn't finish Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And again, don't, when you read the word discipline, do not read in your mind spank. That is not what the Bible is saying. Does the Bible say that there are times that a parent, a loving, calm, caring parent might spank their child? Yes, but the, the word, when it says discipline, it is not talking about that. It's talking about discipleship. Dad and mom are discipling them to become God-fearing adults. Proverbs 29, 15 and 7, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself 
which is a lot of what's going on today, what implication does that have for cell phones, technology? But a child left to himself or herself brings shame to his mother. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. So in other words, if you train your children, then most of the time they're, gonna, they're going to be a blessing as you age throughout the, your life. Then uh, next, let's move to instruct constantly, which we kind of dealt with. So I'm going to kind of just move on. Uh, I kind of combine those two. But Proverbs 22, 6. Uh, well, let's take a few moments just to explain that under instruct. Um, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Remember what we said, that a proverb is not a promise. A proverb is an axiom. It is a generally accepted truth, but they're not always hard, fast rules. They shouldn't be looked at as rules. They should be looked at as wise sayings, things that in enlighten us in the ways of God, in the ways of how, remember this is the thing, how to live out the commandments of God. That's what the book of Proverbs is. So you've got to take Proverbs and link it to uh, the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Here's the law. Here's how you do it. That's what, that's what this is about. Okay. So train up a child. So having this knowledge, how would you train a child according to the Bible? Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Bring them to church. That's a good start. Teach on the Bible, right? Train up a child in the way he should go or she should go. In other words, can I say it another way? Train up your children in the word of God, in the commandments of God. So what is this, what implication does this have for a Christian home, for Sunday school, for a Christian school? What's your mandate from God? Train them in the Word of God. So train up a child in the way he should go. That's God's commandments. This is the way, the way to God and the way he should go. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, a way some misunderstand this is train up a child in the way he or she should go. And even if they depart from the faith, someday God says they'll come back. Even when they're old, they'll return. I wish that were true, but that is not what this verse means. This verse is not promising that our wayward children will come back. Now, they might. We need to pray for that. God may very well use this verse like that, but in the Hebrew and in the ter interpretation here, here's what this means. Train up a child properly in the ways of God, in his word. And as he's growing old, he will stay on the way. See this verse as a way. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even as he's growing old, he will continue to do the things you have taught him to do. So it's not, there'll be half their life, they will be living for the devil, and, but then they're going to come back because you took them to Sunday school or something. Uh, no, it's train the child. And, you know, we need to not look for uh, exit strategies like, I mean, Sunday school is vitally important. Uh, you know, all the things that we can do as a church to come to the aid of parents to train up, train up children in the truth of God is very important. But the primary responsibility for raising the next generation for the glory of God and the belief of Jesus, in Jesus Christ is laid upon dads and moms. And quite honestly, mainly dads. That's why I say when God said that the man is to be the spiritual head of his home, that's not always a blessing. It's a heavy burden. Because what God is saying is, when it comes time to find out what happened in your home, coming to you. Think of Eve. She, she knew. She had been instructed not to take that. She took that apple or fruit and partook of it. And man took of it as well. But she did it first. 
And who, who, who did the blame fall on? Adam. And that's why the Bible says, and she took and she gave it to her husband who was with her. It's pointing out Adam's failure. That's what it's doing right there. This verse, Proverbs 22, 6, is telling us that our home should be a disciple-making factory. You know, we should be constantly gearing our homes, and even as grandparents and great-grandparents, gear our home as training places in the things of God. Example, how do you best instruct? Example. You know, uh, model. We, we should always model what we want to produce. So if we want children that read their, teenagers and ch children that read their Bible, we should read our Bible. If we want children that, to, to go to the youth ministry or, or to church, then we need to be in church. If we want our children to love God, they need to see us loving God. So Proverbs 22, 6, again, is an example of that. Proverbs 13, 1 through 3 and here you get both. In verse, in verse uh, 1 of Proverbs 13, A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So there's the first one, instruction. But then we get in verse 2 and 3, From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of, a, of the treacherous is for violence, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Can I show you what happened there? He just said, here's what a wise son is. And then he goes to, and a foolish father and husband, you might say, who can't control his mouth is going to have a world of trouble. What did we just get there? The importance of instruction and the importance of modeling. The father can't expect anything from his children or, you know, or the mother unless we're doing it. You know, we have to, we have to grow in Christ first. Uh, and then Proverbs 20, verse 7, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Proverbs 27. So in other words, the man who walks, or the woman who walks in the integrity of Scripture, a, a godly Christian, their children are blessed after them because they have lived for God openly. And their children have been able to observe this, they have been able to follow this, and they have also been able to be blessed and, and enriched by this godly presence of, of a godly father or a godly mother. And then lastly, uh, love. And we talked a little bit about this biblically and deeply. One time I heard um, James Dobson say, he said, you can get a lot of things wrong, but it, you need to make sure that your whole, that your family is characterized by love. And oftentimes your teens or children will, will turn out okay. Yes, I, I think there's some wisdom in that, when we, but we're going to need to understand this word. Filling our house with love does not mean that we just let our children do whatever they want. Or we give our teenagers money so they can just go to wherever and do whatever. Okay, because the truth is that's not loving them. We already saw that, didn't we? A child left to himself brings his mother to shame. So biblical, that's why I say fill our house with love and yes, love covers a multitude of sins. And I think as a mom and a dad, we're going to make some mistakes, aren't we? Even I don't care how hard we work at being biblical or how hard we work at trying to do things well. Uh, we're going to make mistakes. Amen? We're going to have, we're going to have that parental guilt. Uh, I tell my kids, you've got to have something to tell the counselors. So... Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, love covers a multitude of sins. Did my parents do it exactly right? No. Did your parents do it exactly right? No. But if you had parents that were working at it and trying, uh, then you're blessed. Um, and, but our goal should be love biblically and deeply. So, uh, and I struggle on which one to go which because if it's biblical, it's deep. But if it's deep, it probably should be biblical. So what I mean by biblical? Well, you know, well, I, you know, uh, let's say my little boys come out. And uh, so I've changed my beliefs and uh, he's okay. No, he's not. And neither are you, <laughs> you know, or I, if we believe like that. The truth of God is not up for grabs. And God doesn't change his standards of righteousness based upon my family members. Love biblically. And so how do I love biblically? I love them the way God has loved me. I want for them the knowledge of God, obedience to God, the knowledge of the truth. You know, these kinds. Not that, I, not that I'm giving us liberty to argue and fuss or preach at our kids all the time. I'm not, not, I don't think the Bible's saying that either. It's this nurturing, discipleship, modeling, relational way of shepherding uh, in, a, in a biblical sense. The way Christ, if you want a good example, two good examples. How God shepherds us. If you want to know how to do that, go to Psalm 23. Want to know how to be a good parent? Go to Psalm 23. God is shepherding us, and we learn how to shepherd our children the way God shepherds us. The other one? Want to learn how to do that? Go to Jesus. How did Jesus deal with the disciples? He taught them. He was with them. He modeled them. He prayed with them and for them. He corrected them at times. You know, these kinds of things. And deeply, deeply. It shouldn't be a performance-type love. Uh, conditional type love. Um, it shouldn't be fickle love. It ought to be hearty and deep and characterized by holiness and godliness. You say, well, that's a tall order. Yeah, it is. And it takes a lifetime to, to grow in it, doesn't it? See, everything God's asked us to do, even as Christians, is going to take our whole life, and then we still won't be perfect Till we get to heaven. Keep those things in mind. Let me give you a couple verses here. Proverbs 17, 6, when talking about loving biblically and seeing one another a certain way, uh, feeling and sensing this deeply. Proverbs 17, 6, grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. Two things there. Glory, or ch grandchildren are the crown of the aged. And I've got, after service, a lot of pictures, if y'all want to see, of my grandchildren. Uh, this is Levi. Here's Levi right here. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. Amen. But do children see this? And the glory of children is their father. We've lost that a lot in our culture. Proverbs 10.1, a wise son makes a glad father. And we could say that about a daughter too, couldn't we? A wise son makes a glad daughter, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. How many mother lays awake at night praying and weeping over a wayward son? Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, better is an open rebuke than hidden love. See that? Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. It's better to correct our children out of this kind of love than it is to love them from afar while we watch them destroy their lives and see, and see them eventually, as he says, and you shall save their soul from Sheol, or literally you shall save their life from death, and you might save their soul from hell. The development of the conscience is, is very much linked to biblical, proper, tempered, loving discipline in, their ch in childhood. And so when that's not done, a hardness, a coldness, a 
lack of sensitivity or humility uh, begins to develop so that when they get older, they're self-willed and they are not going to bow to you or to anybody else or to God. And I, I'll be honest, I hate to say this, but I, I mean, you, maybe you did too. But 25 years ago, I said, we are raising a group of children who are going to be megalomaniacs. Because all we're doing is affirming them. All we're worried about is letting them know how good they are. And now they can't even hold down a job. Because the first time their boss walks down the hallway and says to them, I don't want this done like this. I need it done this way. <laughs> I'm leaving. I can't take this. It's ridiculous, isn't it? And that's just the practical aspect of it. But the truth is, what the Bible's telling us here. If you, take, if you discipline your child in the right way, you're making their heart and their conscience, you're preparing their conscience to receive the instruction of God's Word. Um, and so I'm not saying you can discipline somebody into the kingdom of God. What I am saying, though, is that we can, we can do things that encourages humility in each other's lives. And that's true of children. And so Proverbs 23, 22 through 26 will wrap up. Listen to your father who gave you life. It means listen to your father who gave you life. In other words, this is the man that brought you into the world. Why would you not listen to him? Children, can I say this? Children are being turned against their parents by our society, by the public school system. Excuse me. I know that's a sacred cow. But you've got children who can, do, can make life-altering decisions at school. And, and teachers, and principals, and administration will help them hide it from you as parents. That is a travesty and a crime as far as I'm concerned. No, children need to see that their parents, nobody loves you like your parents. Nobody. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, yes, there are some out there who, bless them, have had that deprived of them. And we, the church, ought to rise to the occasion as much as we can to offer healing in loving relationships, fathering relationships, mothering relationships. You know, when they, one time they came to Jesus and they said, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside for you. And Jesus pointed to his disciples and said, these are my mothers and my brothers. There's a lot of people that haven't had the kind of father they should have. They haven't had the kind of mother they should have or the family they should have. But they can have many mothers, many fathers, many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And a heavenly father that does nothing wrong. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Coggins Church.